We are in a season of revival. There is an outpouring of the Spirit of God. And I have one question for you. Are you hungry for more of God? I know that I am, and I'm here with Tom Hollis, and I'm going to assume that Tom is as well. Well, that's interesting because <laughs> we're going to be talking about that. We'll be speaking with Lisa Whittle, and she's written a, a book called I Want God. And I have to tell you, Lisa's got some things in here that just, uh, they make you wonder, where is your hunger? Is your hunger there for God? What are the things that I need to do to, uh, to have that hunger, to really want God? Do we want God? We're gonna ask those questions today and find out from, from her stories, from her study, from her experience of studying revival as well, how important that desire for God is. You don't want to miss this. I know, that's a great word because I also want, you know, French fries or I want more money. So it's going to be great to dive into the topic of I want more Do you have French fries God. with you? I don't have French fries with me. Actually, I haven't <laughs> had French do, fries I mean, in a long time. You, know, yeah. you can't have French fries and be on Christian television, oh, Tom. My. Maybe a couple here and there. Yeah. But I know this by watching today's program, you will learn how to pursue God and experience His goodness like never before. Plus, you'll learn how to not get so caught up in the busyness of life and be able to make more room for God in your life. Isn't that our prayer? And that's not all. We have a Stump the Host segment, which includes a Stump the, the viewer. viewer question for you, the audience. We're not supposed to point the camera, but this is for you. Everyone watching will get a chance to test your Bible knowledge skills and earn a chance at winning a cool, prize pack. That's right. It's a cool pack. It's a cool <laughs> prize pack. Well, uh, it's, it's going to be a great program. And I have to say, if you're hungry for God and desire for him to be constantly present in your life, you're going to want to listen to what our next guest has to say. Lisa Widow is a Bible teacher. She's a best-selling author. And in her new book, I Want God, she shares how we can seek after God and experience his presence in a whole new life altering way. Lisa, welcome to Hope Today. Thanks so much. It's so good to be with you. Hey, good to have you back. Good to, it's been a, a, a minute here since we've had you on the show. It's really good to have you back. Let me ask you about uh, when, when some disciples of John's went and began to follow Jesus, he turned around and said, what do you want, you know, or what do you seek in some versions? It's really an important question what does it mean to really want God? We all say we do, but what does it mean? I was so compelled by that, that passage in John that it really drove me to, to ask what you're asking right now, which is, what does it even mean to want God? The reality is, Tom, that we, 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 we know that we need God. And I think that's something that we talk a lot about in church and in Christian circles. I need God. And certainly we do. And there's just a vulnerability and a, a, a real need to acknowledge that need. Uh, but desire drives us in life. And so one of the things we don't as often talk about in faith circles and in church is desire because we automatically attach that to something secular. But the reality is, is that Christ put within us the desire to desire him. And so desire is not a taboo subject. In fact, we should be talking about it. And we know from that passage in John that the question that, that Jesus himself asked was, what do you want? Which shows us how important that, that question is for us to, to discern inside ourselves because what we want drives what we do in life. It drives what we fight for. It drives what we chase. It drives what we tolerate. And um, it, it drove what the disciples would live for and eventually what they would die for. And so it's it's the most compelling question, I believe, that we can be asking ourselves today. Yeah, you have a, another word you use a lot is desire. And, um, you know, what, what does that component of desire play in all this? Because you have a quote that I love in the book where you say, Say that we have a stirring in us at times and we have a desire for God, but it, you say it gets pushed into an emotional trash compactor, I guess, of life that just pushes it all down. Could you unpack that for us? 
Well, I think what I'm really talking about here is sort of this this trend towards emotionalism. And sometimes when we're in this place where we're in desperate need, uh, we're, we're seeking God, maybe we're in a, even in a, a faith setting where we are feeling the spirit, right? And so we, we, we get very emotional about things. That's a stirring. But in the midst of life and everything that's going on, it gets pushed into this, this sort of trash compactor of other emotions and other feelings. And at some point, we have to get past all of those emotions, and we have to say, what is our core desire in life, and how does that then compel us to 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 move forward in life? And so, when we're talking about this idea, Tom, of, of what do we want, this is this 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 core uh, this core thing that drives us inside of our bones that has us moving forward. It's not just this temporary emotional feeling that comes and goes with the blowing of the wind, because that can happen with any kind of thing. Uh, And it's also in pulling apart what gets in our way of that, because all kinds of things in life will, will get in our way. And so that's what I really unpack in the book, I Want God, is, yeah, you can want God, But then what gets in the way and addressing those idols that can come between that core desire? Because, again, it's not just the stirring. It's not just getting in in sort of this moment with other people where we're rallying and kumbaya and emotionalism. No, it's saying your core desire needs to drive you in life. And when it does, it changes absolutely everything. Yeah, one of those things that you talk about that uh, really resonated with me is comfort, how much we love Comfort. I've, I've said, I think I've said it on the air before. I love my comfort zone. I got a recliner in there, pillows. I'm ready to just stay there. You have a funny story about snow tubing that kind of illustrates uh, what comfort can do to us. Yeah, well, comfort is, I, I think, the thing that has gotten in between my desire for Christ and myself the most. And I think for most people, that is the reality of it's the underlying thing that gets in our way the most. You know, I was talking about in the book about how my family and I were going to go snow tubing in the mountains. And I was excited to do that. And of course, my primary goal was to have fun with my family. I wanted to do that. But my secondary goal, and it was kind of close, was to not be cold. Which is a bit ridiculous if you think about it, because you're going to the mountains, it's going to snow, it's, you know, you, you've got to have all that in order to snow tube um, in, in a great way. But I wanted us to not be cold, and so I packed us to the hilt with all of these things that would make us not cold, including these, like, snow masks that made us look like we were <laughs> snow robbers. Uh, and it was it was quite a scene. But when we got out there to the place where we were going to snow tube, uh, I looked at all of us and here we were dressed to the hill. We weren't cold, but I went to take a step and my son had formed this massive snowball and he went to throw it at me and his aim was quite good. And he connected with me, but I couldn't move because in my process of wanting to be not cold, I had made myself immobile. And so I couldn't move. I couldn't maneuver. I was packed to the hilt with clothes. I wasn't cold but I also was immobile. And so there was a real lesson for me in that because not only could I really not have fun with my family because I couldn't run around freely and I really couldn't even walk to where I was supposed to snow tube, um, but I had I had given up what I actually wanted for a secondary goal, which was to not be cold. And there was comfort yet again getting in the way of what I wanted the very most. And it really illustrated to me how that happens in life so many times, that comfort God over and over again. And I hear from so many people who say, I just want God to use my life. I, I, I so passionately want him to, and I don't know why he doesn't. While we sit on the couch and we just are fearful to make any kind of moves for the kingdom of God. And that's an example of how comfort gets in our way. That is such a great illustration. And um, I know that you are a student of revivals and there have been some really significant uh, moves of God as of recently in the past year. How does the statement, I want God, fuel a spiritual revival and hunger in our lives? 
Oh, goodness. I mean, I have the chills. Revivals, I, I think when you look at revivals, I mean, you look at Pentecost. That's the, I mean, that's the greatest revival we could ever study in the book of Acts. You've got, you know, you've got the Great Awakening. You've got, uh, you, you've got Asbury uh, that most people know about. You've got the Welsh Revival of the early 1900s, which I've studied extensively. This, this desire is really what stokes revival. But I want to also say that we see these corporate gatherings. By the time you see these things break out and make the news and all that, this has happened inside of our hearts. And that's what's the most compelling about it, because out of desperation is when revival comes. And so if you feel in your spirit desperate uh, for change, desperate to quit, desperately sick of yourself or desperate for God, you are actually positioning yourself really well for revival to come. And so I don't believe that we can force revival. I mean, that's the Holy Spirit moves where he moves. But I believe that there is a powerful positioning that can happen. And so if you say, man, I, I, I actually feel just terrible because I feel just desperate and I don't know what to do. I hear that and no one wants to feel desperate. But what I will tell you is that desperation where we get on our knees and we seek God and we pray, those are the places where God begins to have breakthrough. And that's when revival happens. And it is compelling in, in, in a way that I can't even put to words. And I don't even know that we could put actually pictures to it and all of those things. Well, I mean, it's something we all say that we want. You know, about this whole thing of when we really get straight with God here about desiring Him and, and we, we put that above everything else, what tangible things change in our life? I mean, you've got a, you've got a list of questions to ask yourself uh, the, in the book, 40 Questions that are very challenging uh, in the book, I Want God. Could you just kind of uh, let us know when, when we really get to the place uh, where we're getting right with God about everything, what's tangibly different? I, I think that's a great question. And I will tell you what's, what's changed in my own life tangibly that has been powerful. I think one of the things is the complication that we feel in our life where we, we are sort of frozen by indecision and people pleasing, those things really lessen and diminish because when you are pursuing a, a really a singular desire, when you want God more than anything else, a, a lot of your decisions become a lot less complicated. You are chasing after, after one thing versus a lot of things. And uh, I know in my life that's been very, very powerful because uh, a lot of the times where I felt afraid to speak or uh, I've been uh, worried about what other people were going to think, or you know I've had misdirected desires. It's become a lot more clear in the face of what do I really want, and I really want God, and this is my passion, this is my pursuit. It's not that life doesn't still have hard things. We live in a very real world, uh, but it is that a lot of those decisions become a lot less complicated. And I think for a lot of us, that's where we would love to be uh, in our life. And so wanting God and that singular desire changes that. Lisa, I'm thinking about that statement, you know, I want God. And you went to the floor to your knees <clears throat> and you said that to the Lord. And he showed you practical things, practical steps for you to take. What did the Lord show you and like, how could that apply to us today? Well, the, the first thing that I think the Lord really revealed to me, Amy, was that the things that I thought I wanted, I actually wanted to be free from wanting them. Mm -hmm. So that was very, very powerful for me. I think there's a lot of confusion in our lives. And so when we, we think we actually want to uh, be approved by other people and have control in a lot of ways. And, and I think those things are very, become very clear that what we really want is we want freedom. We want freedom from wanting people to approve of us and to have to make sense of everything that's happening in a crazy world that will actually never make sense to us, right? So I think that was something powerful that the Lord really uh, helped me with. Another thing that, that 
made he made completely clear to me was when I am in, when I'm working in your life and you give me part of you, that is actually not going to ever create the thorough work and change inside of your heart that I want. And so I think when we say I want God, that's that's simply a declaration. It's powerful to say that something completely else to actually uh, walk through what that looks like. And so one of the things he asked me to do in those moments was um, I, I at the time had released a book. I, I, I was very active on blogging at the time. And he asked me to lay that aside for 30 days, for the, uh, lay aside all the blogging, all the promotion of the book, which might sound small for some people, but in your area of work, it would be like asking you to take 30 days off of work. And most of us can't do that. We can't afford to do that financially and all those things. But what I've realized is when, when the Lord speaks to us and asks us to do something, uh, it's the obedience and the follow through that really changes. So I, I would say the, the immediate obedience and then the continued long obedience is, is really important, whatever God is asking you to do. You know, I want to ask you what you, your ultimate hope is for people who read the book. But I want to read a verse out of the book that just haunts me. It's towards the back of the book and it's from Revelation to the Church of the Ephesians. And it says, you don't love me or each other as you did at first. Look how far you have fallen. That is very kind of a haunting thing. I, we all tend to think, oh, well, we've got... We're, we're serving the Lord uh, as well as we can. But what really is your hope for people that would read the book and take the, the next steps? Well, what you read was uh, really what sort of um, grounds the entire book uh, from, from the passage in Revelation. Uh, and what I, what I hope for folks is that from some of the really practical takeaways from the Word of God, not least a little's idea, is that people will begin to not only see God, uh, maybe for the first time in a long time or maybe for the first time ever, but also see how much He loves you and what wanting Him the most, that ultimate desire back to Him will do for your life. Uh, I, I pray that you will, you will just fall on your knees and uh, really have that desire stoked in your heart that will absolutely change everything. Lisa, thank you so much. You know, we're having a little conversation here, but I got a feeling that if we really grasp this and God shows up, it's going to go from conversation to like incredible, like transformation things happening in our life. And, and uh, I want to highly recommend this book. I want God, how to love him with your whole heart and revive your soul. Lisa, thank you so much for writing it. And thank you for being with us today. Thank you, Tom and Amy. It has been my joy. Well, God bless. It's very, very challenging. It will challenge you to your core, really. So you need to need to have a look at that. Well, don't go anywhere. Stump the host and Stump the Viewer are next. When we think of the New Testament disciples, it's easy to idealize their walk with God. But they were just like you and me. They needed a great deal of help to stay on the right path. We're excited to announce that Tom Hollis has a new devotional coming out this June. Spirit Walk follows the apostles as they attempt to follow Christ, as reflected through the book of Acts. Their experiences can be ours as well. All we need to do is follow the Spirit. Enjoy 40 short devotional entries and discover how the journey of the apostles relates to us today. Spirit Walk includes a daily verse, prayer, and space to journal your personal reflections. Be among the first to receive Tom's devotional, which releases June 12th. Ask for your copy of Spirit Walk when you give today. Call 888-665-4483 or go to ctvn.org slash donate. Thank you for your generosity. Hope happens here. Wasn't that a great conversation that we just had? I love what Tom just said. He doesn't even know that he said this profound statement, how a conversation can turn into a transformation in your life. I mean, that's powerful. Hopefully there's at least one thing that is said, if not many, that can really transform our life today. But right now they're gonna try to transform us and stump the host. So here is the first question. 
When Jesus returned to the synagogue after his temptation, from which book was he asked to read? Isaiah. Isaiah. Yes, Isaiah. we're going to say Isaiah. Isaiah. Yeah. All right, yeah. And remember, he's, he's, he, he said that this was fulfilled in your by hearing. The prophet, yes. And it wasn't exactly well received, was it? <laughs> nope. Would <laughs> you like to preach one day, Amy, and have them hustle you out of the I church? Know. <laughs> mm. Well, let's go to number two. The Lord God made a covenant with the Israelites where? This is interesting. Wait, covenant God with the Israelites. Israelites. He made a covenant with them, with Abraham. The, well, he did. The Abrahamic covenant. Yeah, this is with all but the Israelites. All the Israelites, Israelites with this Moses, is, he made yeah. a covenant. Where did he do that? Um, with the Ten Commandments, right? I think the covenant's with Abraham. Okay. And, and where he was in... <sighs> we're, 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 we're. Egypt? <laughs> no. I don't think, no, no. he wasn't or in, in Israel. Egypt. <laughs> uh, this is not going out uh, very well. Um, I sure wish we could call in Lisa for a lifeline. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, uh, so I, I, I don't know if I have the answer to this. I don't Do you have either. an answer? No. We're, we're striking out. <laughs> Horeb. Horeb. We'll go look uh, it up. Well, Deuteronomy 5 2. H O R E B. Now, what, yeah. what country is that in? I don't know. It's in so, Horeb. <laughs> it's in Horeb. It's well, we didn't do very well on that one. Let's go to the let's next one. Let's go to one more. Yeah. I don't like those long, awkward pauses where we miss it. <laughs> what do the four chariots in the prophet Zechariah's vision symbolize? Wow. Prophet Zechariah, four chariots. I don't, I know, don't know this. I don't know this. We are really, this. really, really bombing out here today, but I don't think I have an answer for this I one. I don't either. I'm, nope. Heaven's spirits. Wow. Zechariah 6 to 5. Go back and study your Bible, Hollis. <laughs> It's so weird to read through the Bible, and so, I mean, you know, uh, yeah, it's not I like we know. have it memorized. I've, yeah, I've probably read through the New Testament at least Many maybe times. 35 times over the last several <laughs> years. The Old Testament, probably 15 or 20 times, and I still, there's a lot in there that you can miss. But uh, anyway, we want to also let you know that you can have fun and play this kind of game, too, on Stump the Viewer. So fun. Well, in case you're new to Stump the Viewer, we get a chance to ask you, the audience, a Bible trivia question. If you know the answer to today's question, you can go to stump or ctvn.org slash stump to play along and select the answer. If you guess correctly, you will be entered into a random drawing and could be selected to win this awesome prize pack that includes the book of the month and the Cornerstone TV T-shirt. Look at this. I don't have one of these. It's upside I down. I don't, they're going to have they're, one. Yeah, you got to get one of these. Wear it with uh, a nice okay. suit jacket, some jeans. That's right. That's a cool so vibe. let's look at your question. How many total lepers did Jesus heal as recorded in all of the Bible? Now this is the grand total of all the lepers he healed. Is it A, 9, <laughs> B, 10, C, 11, or D, 12? I'll have you know that I got this wrong when I was guessing uh, before the show, just in keeping with how Stump the Host has gone today. So if you know the answer, you can go to ctvn.org stump slash stump to play along. Fun. Well, <laughs> yes. Yes and no. Sometimes it's fun and, and sometimes <laughs> it's not. But you know what? Isn't that life? Sometimes yeah. you have the answers for things. Sometimes you don't. But the bottom line is to get back to the very rich topic we were talking about today is that desire, that passion. Do we want more of God? Do we even want to read more of the word? Do we want to spend more time in his presence? Do we want to sit more time? In I mean, they're ha like missing those questions makes me think, 
I got to read more. I got, <laughs> but I could be digging it. It, it is like a never ending treasure, the yes. Bible. And yes. the, it's like the more you read, the less you know. And yeah. well, we you modeled know, that it's today. It's interesting, you know, I've, I've been teaching uh, on Wednesday night in, jo in the book of Jonah. And yeah. there's so much that I've learned about the heart of God in that, mm -hmm. is that God cares for people that are far from him. And God cares for us and gets us in the right place. Even if a fish has to swallow us up and get us to the right place, God can do that. So the question is, are we seeking him? Are you today mm -hmm. seeking God with your whole heart, with that desire? Lisa was talking about desire as being a key thing that we need to have that desire for God. You know, I think it was C.S. Lewis that said, our desires are too weak, not too strong. We, we, we take the easy thing, the sin or the, the distraction rather than taking the real thing, God. That's the one that matters. To seek after God with all of our heart and with all our mind, soul and strength, that is what will make the difference in our spiritual life. Amen. She has a great quote in the book by Flannery O'Connor. God is feeding me and what I'm praying for is an appetite. Yes. So listen, we are all craving something. We, we, well, what we're really craving is a spiritual, deep relationship with God. But how many times we, we fill that desire with such surface thing? You know, I was with Dr. Phil, my husband and I, uh, you know, this past week. And he said, we are picking up our cell phones like 340 times a day. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like he said, a teenager, it's probably 500 times a day. And I just, something kind of just dropped in my stomach. I thought, God, help us to desire more of you. Help us to want more of you than we want social media or money or food or shopping or anything. We need right. a move of God like never before. Right. I can get easily distracted. And we live in a distracted age. And we don't want to be distracted from the things that really matter, the things of God. Say, we want to mention that tomorrow on Hope Today, Pastor Glenn Germany from Jesus Dwelling Place in North Braddock will be on the show. He is the one that you've seen where a gun was drawn and pointed at him and actually misfired, didn't fire, uh, and he was saved. Uh, listen, this is a serious thing that we're in here. We're in a battle for the souls of men. We're in a battle for God to move in our lives. So let's be the people of God that we need to be so that the people out there can hear about his love. Have a great day.